Welcome to the Shia for this evening. And uh, thank you for some of you <clears throat> have already responded to your preference. Meanwhile, in other words, when we're switching over to after the clock changes, that's not next. Matzah Shabbos will still be Matzah Shabbos. But after that, we'll have to do it another time. And I asked whether to prefer on Sunday evening or Thursday evening. Meanwhile, um, should we say the odds are even, <laughs> however you call it. So um, we'll see. I'll work it out. And whoever can make it, there's always the recording available. So whichever. We'll, we'll see. Um, so this came up during Shabbos. It's not on the list which I sent out before Shabbos. And that is about the Nusach of Anenu. So when it on a, on a fast day, we add Anenu uh, in so in the quiet Shmoin Esra, it's added in Shoimeya Tefila. But the and that's only at Mincha. In Chazoras Hashaz, the Chazan says Anenu between the Brocha of Goyel Yisroel and Rafa'enu. And it's said as an extra bracha. In other words, if normally there's 19 brachas in the Shwan Asra, on a fast day, it's and the Chazor Sashat, it's 20 brachas. So here we have the this is the top of the page. You have here the text from the Shukhnoruch, the first seif of Tov Kuf Samach Vavin Erachayim. Tanis Tzibur, the Shuliach Tzibur says, Aneinu, between Goyel and Roifei, and he finishes off, V'choyseim Baruch Ato Hashem, Ho'oyne La'amo Yisroel Be'ez Tzara. He who answers the prayers of Eden in a time of difficulty. So on this, both the Taz and the Morgan of Rome, and then subsequently the Mishnah Brura, say, well, no, the Nusach of the Siddur is Ha'oyne Be'ez Tzara. The premier Godim comments on this, and he says, Hashem answers the prayer of Goyim also, as evident in the beautiful prayer of Shloim HaMelech by the dedication of the Beis HaMikdosh. It's really a very beautiful um, prayer where he's asking Hashem, people will pray, will come here to pray and answer that Phyllis, and he asks also for, clearly he asks even if Umar Sa'ila, if non-Jewish people will come to the Beis HaMikdosh, Hashem should listen to their prayer. So Hashem answers the prayers of Umar Sa'ila of Goyim also. And therefore, they question the emphasis, because Hashem listens to the prayers of um, Goyim also, if they pray in the Eist This is now why I find Ironic is I've, I've, I've put on the on the display here in the bracha of Shemaya Tefila. There's a difference between Nusach Ashkenaz and Nusach Svard. Nusach Svard, which is on the left, sorry, on the right, that is Ki Ato Shemaya Tefilas Kol Peh. Nusach Ashkenaz, which is on the bottom left, Ki Ato Shemaya Tefilas. Amcho Yisroel Barachamim. When I say Sfard, I mean Sfard as in Oriental. The Polish Nusach has here typically kind of merged the two Nuschois and made it into Ata Shemet Filas Kolpe Amcho Yisroel Barachamim. But I'm not dealing with that. I'm dealing here now with the original Ashkenaz, with the original Sfard. So Ashkenaz in Shemeat Filo. Are saying Kiata Shemet Filas Amcho Yisrael Barachamim. And Sfard are saying Kiata Shemet Filas Kolpe. Now let's look at those statements. I never thought about it before. Shemet Filas Kolpe means you listen to every mouth, and that means including Umar Soiva. Shemet Filas Amcho Yisrael Barachamim, the emphasis is they listen to the prayers of Yidden with compassion. So now it's kind of the tables are, 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 are turned. In Anenu. Ashkenaz say ha'oyna based tzara, not mentioning ha'oyna amisro based tzara. But in Shemayat Filo, Ashkenaz say tzara samchui so brachamim. In Nusach Sfard, so in Aneinu, the emphasis is ha'oyna amisro based tzara. 
And in Shemei Tzfilo, it's just Shiat Shemei Tzfilo's Kol Peh. If you follow what, what's bothering me here, is that the accommodation for Umar Sa'ilam is said in, in both Nuskhois. In Ashkenaz, it's said in, on, in Anenu. And in uh, Anusach um, Sfard, it's said in, in Shemer Tfila. So I found that very interesting. And I, I don't really have a, 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 um, an explanation because. Um, when Shemayat, of course, as a Yochid, we say Anenu in Shemayat Filo. So we say, Hashem, um, um, we'll, we'll finish off. But as they are standalones, standalones, we've got here a bit of an interesting conflict where one in Nusach Ashkenaz, their Dafka in Anenu, exclude, uh, um, including Umas Oilom and the Sfard. Um, exclude them asylum and in Shemeat Philo, it's the other way around. Um, so I don't have an answer. It's just this is my uh, ruminations from this morning. Let's start off the list of what we had um, already published. And someone asks me the following question that we all know that there's a virtue in giving Tzedakah discreetly, the idea of and the Rambam in Hichas Mat Nisanim. Talks about the various levels, and we we know there's lots of stories in the Gemara about giving out tzedakah discreetly. On the other hand, we do know that there is virtue dafka in mitzvah lafarsim or a mitzvah to not keep it a secret and to, to to share it with others to inspire others. It's asking for some guidance. Someone. I'm not sure whether this is this is correct. Someone had told him that that, that if you hide the fact that you're giving stocker, it's actually actually I don't know whether it's sinful, but something missing the point. So here he was in a dilemma. He gives stocker is a, not a not a wealthy person at all, but gives very generously. That's what he told me in quiet. He gives very generously. And the Abish to make makes sure that he has a twenty pounds. You know, when he, uh, he has a twenty pound of um, a note in his pocket, he'll give it to someone at the door. And when he doesn't have a twenty nine a twenty pound note in his pocket, the Abish to make so no one comes to the door. So <laughs> it works that way. So it's very interesting. But he, he was asking, how do we deal with this? So I looked up a, the sikh of the Rebbe talking about one of the sikhs of the Rebbe talking about giving stocker. Um, and addressing this union of giving stock in private or in public. So let's read through this sikha. Um, sorry, the reference on the, on the notes is, is, is uh, the wrong reference. Do all that later. So, the giving stock is a You can't compare giving stock because you have to. Or because you want to, and there is it comes a point when the person is so wants to his his whole metzias, his whole being is. You look at this person, you see he's a stocker person. He's a person who lives with giving stock. So then the Rebbe continues in this sicha, and he says, "I there is the idea of hatsnei leches imelikecha. There is an idea of being discreet." And that is indeed a great virtue. To the point where this is the Pesach, I believe it's in Malachi, does Hashem want to have all your, your animal offerings? The greatest thing which Hashem has from which you can give is to walk discreetly. However, says the Rebbe, since the people around you are likely to think that you're not contributing and they will take the cue from you not to contribute. Because they'll see a Jew as a Yid Mechubed, an honorable person with a full beard, and is wealthy, and is not participating in this Tzedakah thing. So they can think, oh, this is, a, this is a, a sign, a guidance, that joining into this contribution, this fund, is not for honorable people. Therefore, it's important to give Tzedakah in an open way, 
so that other people should learn from you and follow your example. And that's the idea of mitzvah lafarsim oise mitzvah. That there's a mitzvah that the Ram, Ramo brings from the Rajbo, that there's a mitzvah to publicize those who, do, who perform mitzvahs. And if you want to do hatsneh leches, so then you can do more in addition to this. Um, in addition to what you're giving out in public, then you can also do more. Kohenov Kohen can do twice as much in a discreet way. So, what exactly is the balance here? So, I think what the Rebbe is saying, in the, at least in this context, is that when there is a, a, uh, a public collection for a particular Indian, let's say there's a, a charity, and they have an option to give anonymously or to give, uh, to, give uh, to, to write your name. If you think that by putting your name down, you're going to encourage other people to say, oh, if so-and-so gave so much, is a, raya, is a proof that I should also give twice as much, whatever it may be. So then, it, is, here, this is the Rebbe is saying, don't, don't keep it a secret. There's a, there's a, here, there's a, an appeal, and by people seeing that you've also contributed, they will be uh, encouraged. That doesn't mean that because you give someone at the door 20 pounds that you have to announce that. That, 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 is, that there is a, certainly remains the mile of Atzner Lechas, but when there is a communal effort, so then you should also be um, evidently part of that communal effort. That's the way I understand the Rebbe's uh, word here. Um, and I'm sure there's, there's more to be said about this, but uh, the idea that you can give publicly and they're still going to give privately separately and uh, but not not to be missed not to be obviously um missing out from a, a public uh, um, fundraiser let's move on so here i got a someone in um okay don't look at the name i wanted, wanted to blot out the you shouldn't see the blur of the names never mind he won't mind he sent me this ksuba, he made a chasana this week, last week, and he asked me, can I check over the ksuba, which I did, and I said, it's okay. He sends the ksuba to be printed by a uh, fancy paper. A ksuba is, after all, a chasana document. And the printer says, no, it's not okay. You can't print it this way. So he says, I Raskin said, it's okay. She says, I don't care. <laughs> it's wrong. You can't print it this way. And I, really, I, I, I am, and he was actually, he was right, and I'm going to explain to you why. But just reminds me uh, to a, a story which happened on my street. Two doors away, our Hamish and neighbor went away for Pesach and they loaned the house to, an, to a young family. And they went away, they went out during the day and they slammed the door shut with the keys inside. And um, so now they're locked out. Well, sure, there were children inside, but they were locked out of the house. There was one window on the third floor, or in England we call it the second floor, but either way, it's not exactly something you can climb up without a ladder. So, around the corner of us, there's a Hamish guy, a Hamish builder, who has two long ladders on top of his van. So, let's go and borrow his ladder. So, he says, no, you can't, you can't use, you can't borrow the ladder on Yom, you're not allowed to. Why not? Even if, even if, let's say, it's a klisham lach del sir. even if it were a hammer, if you need to use it, you'd have to, it's, it's not muksa. No, you're not allowed to borrow a ladder. Not allowed on Yom to not allowed. To. So I, I had said it's okay, and then they came back, no, it's not okay. He's right. He's right, because there's a whole discussion in, 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 in Mishnah, in Gemara, that of all things, a ladder must not be carried through the street, a tall ladder. Uh, should not be carried through the street on Yom Tov, that people shouldn't say that he, he's carrying the ladder to fix his roof. So of all things, a ladder is, is, it may, not be, um, may, may not be carried. So we had to find a goy to carry the ladder. And then once the ladder was in place, then the goy was too timid to climb the ladder. So we found a yid who was, <laughs> who was brave enough to climb up the ladder once the goy had put it there. And um, got in and uh, you know, opened the door. Okay, so coming back to, so I'm just comparing that story, which is useful in itself, but the comparing that the printer, he knows his job and he says it's not okay. And the reason for this is 
because Hakol Sharivik Hayom was spelled correct, but put in the middle of the line, which means that some uh, uh, a crooked person could, in the part, first part of that line, until the words Hakol Sharivik Hayom, could write in something. You could write, you could say, and, and on condition you that you also um, give $2 million to so and so, whatever it may be, they can put in anything there. And and it's then going to be endorsed with Hakol Sharir Vakayom. You know, you can say it's in print and handwriting, but that's that's the halacha, yeah. The halacha is that Hakol Sharir Vakayom should be in a way that there's no space for inserting uh, anything which shouldn't be there. And therefore, yeah, the printer was absolutely right. Hakol Sharir Vakayom should have been at the beginning of the line, and uh, which was duly done, and the chasna took place with shot over slachas. Okay, and um, just to confirm that, like writing, so there's an eight volume set on writing ksubas. I don't have the sefer. It's on. I do have it on the uh, computer called Mishpat Ksuba by Rav Bar Shalom, uh, and he writes the following. Let's just read his text. He says one should be careful not to create a gap on the last line of the star of the document by putting the last the words in the middle of the uh, line because that leaves space on the right and, and, and on the left and then the signatures of the witnesses could be ineffective and therefore the last line has to be to uh, justify to the right as the rest of the star which now as i'm talking i'm just now thinking of some subjects which have seen and been involved in the past they sometimes now make them um decorative in a uh in a shape as if like a ball getting narrower and narrower whether this would apply in that instance but there you could say that you can see the the uh, natural or, or the design of the line that it's going in, in that form perhaps there it's a different story but let's move on um i want to just share with you i was once at a uh, a wedding with a place where very few from people were there. And the only, one of the only people who could sign the shah who wasn't a relative of the Hosn or the Kala was someone who couldn't write his name in Hebrew. So, um, so then uh, perhaps I've told this story before. What they did, they, they, uh, they made a dot to dot and he should be able to make a dot to dot and sign his name uh, in Hebrew. Now, actually that is not really valid. In a case of a get, that would be allowed because a get is a, an urgency to if the woman needs to uh, be released from from her husband and we never know where he's going to be next so therefore they, they allowed doing that kind of shtick but in this case uh, which is a ksuba that that alone was not okay the truth was this was somewhere in a spanish um, in south america somewhere he actually signed his name in spanish too so the uh, hebrew dot to dot Himself wasn't valid, but it was a kosher ksuba because he had signed his name also in Spanish, which is which is perfectly okay. Let's move on though. All right, so we were learning this past week in Gemara Erevin. We were talking about garments, and it came up about a um, there, as far as I remember, it's talking in the context of perhaps of, of, of muksa, possibly, um, or lekabel tuma, and it came through my mind. Uh, about using a thin garto for a Kenyan. And sometimes, but by Hasna, usually the Masada Kedushin will bring a, a clean cloth uh, to, for the parties who are committed themselves to do a Kenyan Suda to lift up this cloth. And I've seen sometimes people say, why do you need that? You can just use a garto. And it says in the, the Gemara there in Erevin, it says that siltsul, uh, which means a thin ribbon, but it's because it's been made as a uh, as a beged, as a garment, although it doesn't have the minimum of three by three finger breadth or six centimeters square, but it's also considered a garment. So I was just curious to compare, that's talking about Kabul uh, Tumma, and here we're talking about doing a kin. So I just looked up the Nite Gabriel, who talks about, um, his, I had, about officiating by a wedding, and he writes the following, one should be mahader to take a, a a cloth which is three by three at boys. And therefore, one should avoid using thin garments which don't like, like a gartel. Some say that it is okay, 
even though it doesn't have uh, the shear, machen amo debar dabor lahokil. It is quite common that people will use a thinner garatul, but he does recommend to use a uh, a proper cloth which has got a shear of gimel al gimel. So it's, no, no. if I have that with my with me, I'll use it. If I won't, then I'll use a garatul. Let's move on. I've actually seen past some people even saying use a pen also counts, but I prefer to do things more traditionally. Okay, um, the next thing which we have on our list, which I don't have a slide for, is a guest brought us on Friday night, a guest for Friday night meal, brought us a box of chocolates. May we enjoy the treat on Shabbos. Now, I think we once discussed this in one of the shiurim, and there is the Alter Rebbe, I mean, the beginning of Shin Yud Ches, if food was cooked on Shabbos, that's called Mas Shabbos, and you're not allowed to eat it until after Shabbos. Um, it depends on the person himself who did it, it's a question of um, uh, after Shabbos, but for everyone else, after Shabbos, you're allowed to use it. But um, so that's if, it, if food was cooked on Shabbos. But what about things which were carried? So the Alter Rebbe in Simon Tov, uh, hey, talks about food which was carried beyond the tchum. And he says that's okay to use because the carrying th from beyond the tchum, we're talking about Yom Tov, is a Nisr Drabonon. Because it's a Nisr Drabonon, therefore it's okay to use this stuff, which was carried, which implies that if it were an Isur Minatoira, Malocha, then even though it didn't change, there's a in Simen Shin Yudches, Mr. Brewery brings from the Chayo Adom, a Svore, that since carrying doesn't change the article, it's not as if uh, it was an egg and now it became an omelette. It's the same article brought from A to B. The Chayodim is a bit um, inclined to be mekel to, um, if it was brought b'shoigig. But from the Alter Rebbe, we have, have, I get the impression that the Alter Rebbe takes the view that because the Malochad Eiraisa was done of carrying it through Rosh Hashanah, then you wouldn't be allowed to use it until the end of Shabbos. Um, I have written, as you see in the notes here, a reference in the Sivim Bistea Volume 2, page 228 onwards. There's a long discussion about that, and so it can be taken from there. We'll go on to the next question, and that is um, also this week, which came up this past week. We had um, Antanis Esther, and came. Through, I, I had the. I was I called up for Shlishi. And I was uh, going through my mind, what's the story? When, when it comes to Kriya Satoira, and there are the various psukim which are said aloud. So there's three psukim we have in the in Rishon. Shuv mecharoin apecho v'inochim aloro alamecho. And in Shlishi we have Hashem Hashem keil rachem v'chanun. And then we have v'salachta v'lavaneinu v'lachasein v'lachasein v'chaltanu. So we have three psukim where the Sibur join in. Now, here is the Mishnah Brura in Simatov Kof Samachvav, as you can see, and he writes that the when the people join in and say, Shuv Mecharoin Apecho, and they say, Hashem Hashem Keil Rachem Vachanun, they are saying this as a plea, as a prayer. Please, Hashem, um, retract from your anger, etc. Whereas the Ho'oyle Latoira, the one who has the Aliyah, and the Balkoire, they should not say the Psukim along with the congregation. When the, when the congregation have finished saying those Psukim aloud, then the Chazan says the, those Psukim aloud, and alongside with him, the one who has the Ali. So this point that the chazan should not say it with the kohol, but say it separately. And there's a certain rationale added here that they are saying it as a prayer. You are saying it as, re as reading the record as it is in the Torah. So there's two different things. So the source of this is in the Sefer Hasidim. And <clears throat> so you can read here at the top of the page, when Vayachal is read on the fast day, the chazan, who is the reader, he will fall silent. 
Shuv mecharei napecha minuchem alor olam echo. He will fall silent until they have said those those irrelevant those psukim, and he continues the second line. Ki hakol oima oisu ke ent filo. They are the congregation are saying those psukim as a prayer. Muskavd in libam beloshen bakosha, and they are saying it as a supplication. Ba'chazan akore ene ene rashoy likris beloshen bakosha. He is not pleading now. Elo kach osa Moshe. He's just reporting the record. This is what Moshe did. She's relating what happened. So here we have, now if you noticed, the opening line, He does not talk about the one who has the Aliyah. He has This is in this print. In other prints of the Sefer Hasidim, it has they put in a vlog to say there's two people. And that's where the Mr. Buru is following. There's this two people. There's the one who has the Aliyah and the Chazan. So this is, there's uh, two ways of learning the Halacha here. I have in my hand a, uh, a journal called Mi Megad Yerachim. Now this is from the, there's an annual, there used to be, since, since COVID, it hasn't happened, but there used to be every year a Yarchi a, a conference of Rabbonim in Gan Yisrael in upstate New York. And the uh, the the, uh, the Droshes, the, the Pilpulim, which were represented, were then published in these journals. So one year, I, that's what came through my mind, Rabbi Moshe Bogimilski, he he spoke about this topic when does the this very question when does the one who has the aliyah say the psukim with the chazan or with the koho he pointed out that first of all it was it looks like the observers said that they saw the rebbe would say hashem hashem start off with the tzibur and then say it slowly and continue along with the bar he then points out another thing there is a concept of al tifresh min tzibur so if the Tzibur are saying Hashem, Hashem, Kel, Rachem, Rechanun, so you should be joining in with them. So that's the one side. On the other side, perhaps you should be saying, um, and then there's the, he goes into the whole pilpul. When you have an aliyah, you make the bracha. Is the bracha for, for your reading, but you're not really reading in public. In the olden times, originally, people would have an aliyah, they would read in public. So I understand, you said Bechot in the morning, and then you have an Adira Torah, so you're making a public reading. For this, you're making a brocha. But you're standing there, standing silent. Or even if you're saying it down very quietly, so what? But why are you making a brocha on this? Therefore, some posts can learn shah that you are really making a brocha for the chazan. It's the chazan who's saying aloud, and instead of him saying the brocha seven times over, or three times over in a, in a, in a weekday, so then you're doing the brochas for him. But really, the hero is really him. And you are really just part of the congregation, just saying the brachas for him. If that's the case, then you should say that you should say these psukim along with the congregation. Then there's another opinion of Pascal who say, no, well, you are standing up there, and I know we're not you're not projecting your voice, you're saying it quietly, but you are saying it quietly in a profile as if it were a public profile. And for this, you're making a bracha. So according to this, you you're making a bracha and you're standing there and you're reading. If that's the case, then you should be saying together the chasm. So actually, he goes through the um, different ways of looking at it, and there's merit in both ways. And as I say, he's, um, the observers said that the, uh, the Rebbe would be noyak to stay at least Hashem Hashem, who would start, start off with the Tzibur and then go on, uh, say it slowly, and to join on, join in with the Chaz. Um, does that mean that that's halacha for everyone else? Love Davka, but just it's, it is certainly um, interesting. Now, um, I see here someone's putting a question about before we're speaking about chocolates. What about a guest who brings chocolates and carries them in an area where there is an Arab? If there is an Arab, then you're allowed to use them. Yeah. Someone was, I, I really put this question because someone asked me if someone brings chocolates on Shabbos, do they have to serve them? I, why my response was you are the balabos in your house. You set the agenda, 
and no one who brings stuff to your house should you shouldn't feel beholden that you have to put things on the table because they brought them you are the balabos you do the mice with the i think the mice with the bazush whoever it was in your house you are in control whether you do want to serve or not you shouldn't you shouldn't feel that you have to serve if you want to say they were i think possibly they were thinking because the person put it on shabbos if they didn't don't use it if they don't use it then perhaps the person was doing a tircha on shabbos um which is not, not being used uh, so I, I just feel that a person, Leo, in the, uh, to quote the Megillah, Leo is called Ish Soyer Beveisoy. It's your house, and it's very nice to have guests, but ultimately it's, it's you are the one who is uh, deciding what's being served or not. Let's move on. Okay, so here, prim afternoon, I get this call, and there is, you know, in the Torah we have various kriksiv. We've got words which are written one way and pronounced differently. Sometimes the pronunciation is starkly different. In the Toichacha we have words like that. Usually it's very um, minor difference. But then this was a minion. It looks like everyone was following in handwritten Megillus. So no one corrected the Balkoira. He said, he says, by he be omram. And he and you meant to pronounce it ke omram. So now it's after the Megillah, everyone's gone home, and someone realized, oops, they didn't. The Balkhoira said be omram, not ke omram. In other words, he said the way the ksiv, not the way of the kri. So this is his question. Do they have to now tell everyone come back to Shul and hear it all over again? All right. So we have in Shukhanaruch, in Hilchus, um Kriya Samagil Simitov Reis Tzadi. Says the Mechaber, Ein medaktikin betohu yoiseho. If you make us a mistake in the Megillah, it's not, we don't, 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 one doesn't have to make a fuss about it. This is based upon, uh, we'll, we'll see in this story in the Gemara in, in, in a moment. Vayesh oimri. Some say that this laxity is only betos shahaloshin vahinyan echot. It's only when the language and the context is the same. Kahahu uvda detrei talmidei dahave yasve kamei dera. The story in Gemara Yerushalmi. There were two talmidim sitting in the presence of Rav. Chad kori Yehudim, the chad kori Yehudim. Because in the Megillah, several times the word Yehudim is spelt with a double yud. And the double yud would imply that you should read it Yehudim. So one read it, but it's it's a Greek siv, and the, the uh, correct pronunciation is Yehudim, not Yehudim. And they one read one way, one read the other way. And Rav did not correct either of them. Didn't say you have to go back. So here we have a source that a minor mistake, one doesn't need to repeat. But if it was a, a more significant mistake, then that laxity wouldn't be applicable. So the Mr. Bura adds, like Yoishev and Yoshav. Or you made Omad. Yoishev is sitting in the present tense. Yoshav, he sat in the past tense. That would change the pshat. So now this comes back to the question here. Ke Omrom, be Omrom. Does that change the pshat? So you could read it in English when they said to him on a daily basis, as they said to him on a daily basis. I think that as and when are so close that they don't, it's not significant change. Similar to the, I mean, the difference over here is a base and a, and a chaf, but it's, but then also in Yehudim and Yehudim, it's also an extra Yud being, being put, put in there. So my, my inclination was to say that you, they are Yoitzer. Although you could uh, you know, dig in and say the Mechaber, the Shekhanor, says Haloshin Vohoinyan. I looked around in, in, Mala, in a contemporary forum. I couldn't find anyone who addresses this question directly, the Kri and Ksiv question, uh, in which is a slightly different, pronoun, a different wording. Or different, or different letters here. Um, you could say loshin ve'inyan. He says inyan. It's like a, the inyan is the same. The concept is the same. 
you could argue that the lotion, the word, the, the actual wording is slightly different. But Bichlal here we're talking about a din lechayre. It's not a din deraisa. I know it's divrei kabbalah, but it, uh, it was abdi eved, and so it remained that uh, they were yaitza. But uh, there is room to to uh, be machmer. Okay. Rebendel Safran is asking a question: If the guest had brought the uh, the, the cho box of chocolates through a Carmelis, would the halacha be different? Probably one would be more lenient then, yes, because the other emphasis there is because it's a din em deraisa. Okay, uh, so I've got a call, and before we go further, coming back to this, uh, someone asked me on Friday or Thursday, we have in Megillah several psukim which we repeat, and that's because of there are different nuschoyes, different versions, let's say. Uh, so the particular one which he mentioned was So we repeat that. That's because there's a, a, a doubt whether the vav should be there or shouldn't be there. In Hebrew, when you have several words in sequence, so there's different ways whether you have to put a the vav before each uh, each one, or you can manage without the vovs. And this, I think, I think that even Ezra, beginning of Shmois, talks about this, that it's okay to have Reuven, Shimon, Levi, Vihuda. You can have Reuven, Vishimon, Levi, Vihuda. There's, 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 you can have Reuven, Vishimon, Levi, Vihuda. It's, it's, it's optional to have a vov or not. I'm talking about in 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 style of writing, in, in expressing yourself, in speaking. So here we have Lahashmid. It can be in, in it can be correct in 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 the writing to say la hashmid la regal abed or la hashmid vil regal abed. Both of them are correct in in uh, in, in in style. Both are acceptable styles. Question is, what was actually the tradition? What was actually written by Archimedes uh, Zagdola, etc., back in the times of Mordechai Viesta? So, because we have a dilemma whether it should be ver or without with the vav, so we say that possible that those two words twice. Um, in davening, in the bimei mordechai v'ester, so then whoever composed that filler can choose to put la'areg or v'la'areg. It doesn't matter. It's, it's so the, the person was asking why in, in Megillah we repeat that phrase and why in um, in Alanis we don't repeat the phrase. And the answer is in Megillah we have to say exactly the way it was written down back then, and we have a dilemma, so we say it twice. In the shoin Esther, it's the style of whoever composed that filler, and it's okay if it's slightly, if it's one way or the other. Either way is okay. Let's move on. Um, so I, someone who, one of these um, very kind people who, a big bolt stock himself, but also on Purim distributes significant sums. People raise money, Baruch Hashem, for myself, at last, I don't know, 20 or something years. People give me money for and I was able to uh, distribute three thousand pounds because people had given me some more, some less, and we were able to distribute that on 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 uh, Purim. And so the question was, the money which you're giving to this poor family is going to be um, unreasonable that it's the amount which would be for the use on Purim. It's way beyond their what they would spend on Purim. So is it, does it make sense? So should Matonis Levyoni be geared to their Purim expenditures or can it be uh, giving them a, a larger sum, which would be up to them to use for later? So it's interesting also, earlier in the week, last week, someone asked me, people give him, this is another person, people give him sums for Matonis Levyonim. He runs a Chabad house. Is he allowed to put some of the money, let's say 50% to the Chabad house and 50% to give out to poor families? And I says, no, you're not allowed to do that. If people gave you money for Matonis Lev Yoinim, all of that goes for Matonis Lev Yoinim. Um, they said, if they give me just a push, it's like a pushka. If it's like a pushka, then you can do what you want with it. If they give it to you, but if they give it to you clearly for Matonis Lev Yoinim, and this we have clearly in the Shukhan Aruch, you see it's in the Sadiq Dalits, it's based, Ein Meshanim Mo'ais Purim, let's 
the money given for tzedakah, for, 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 for Purim, should not be given for other things. You can't take Matanus Levyoni money, the Gabe can't take that money and use it for fixing the Eidub or fixing the Mikvah, etc. But Davka Hagaboy, Aval Haoni Yochelasus Boi Masha Yitze. But the poor man himself is allowed to use that money for what they wish. They don't have to spend the Matonas Levyoinim on Purim. They can spend it on other things. They can put it aside. So my son-in-law in, in uh, Detroit, in, in, in Chicago, he sent me that a, a, a similar halacha, which you have in Simen Reishman base in the Hilchas Shabbos. It says if someone was sent, was, was received some food for Shabbos, he shouldn't use it on Shabbos. He shouldn't use it on weekday. Someone sends you uh, food for Shabbos. So it's recommended you shouldn't use it on Friday. But the Alter Rebbe adds in brackets, that's Midas Chesidus. Al Min Hadin Ein Isur Bedovor. But Min Hadin, there's no Isur to use that food at another occasion. And he gives a reference to Tzofrei Tzadik Dalad, which is Aalocha. That the recipient has, has a, a choice whether to um, use it then or not. Now, if you remember, this came out as a continuation of last week's discussion. What is the shear of Matonis Lev Yoinim? Is the shear of Matonis Lev Yoinim a pruta or the shear of a meal, a meal's worth? I mentioned last week that there are poskim who say it's the shear of a meal's worth, which is, uh, we mentioned a, a couple of pounds, whatever it may be. So my son in law says, but whenever the Rebbe spoke about how much Matonis Lev Yoinim is, he mentioned invariably he would say pruta without saying there's another shitter. And I said last week that Mr. Bura, when put it on, that brings from the ritual, the she is a pruta. Now, thinking carefully, if you say the shear of matonis lev yoinim is the shear of a meal, so then you've limited matonis lev yoinim for, for just to be used on Purim. By saying that matonis lev yoinim is a pruta, you're saying it's a gift you should give the poor. What he does with it is up to him. It's not, it's not to feed him on Purim. So in a sense, by saying that Atonis Lev Yoinim is a shear of a meal, in a sense, you've kind of limited that the Matonis Lev Yoinim is, is, is just for Purim. Whereas by saying that Matonis Lev Yoinim is a pruta, so then, then it's, it's, it, it, it is allowing this which is being said, you can use it for anything. And I, you know, the Gemara says that when, when Purim occurs on Shabbos, as it could be if you Purim's on a Friday, so in, in the Shalayim, etc., Book of Choim is on Shabbos. So then you have what's called Purim Meshulash. Some things are done on Friday, some on Shabbos, some on Sunday. So one of the things which are done on Friday rather than on Sunday is Matonas Lev Yoinim. And the word says, because the poor, the whole year, they're waiting for, they're waiting for the Matonas Lev Yoinim. It makes sense that uh, if, if Matonas Lev Yoinim is only to be used on Purim just for one meal, I find it difficult that they are looking forward a whole year excitedly when's Purim going to come for one meal. Whereas if you're going to say that the Moist Purim can be a, a sizable sum, I, I know it's one pruta, but one pruta of one person and, and people can give more and they will give more and it can be for many people. So then they will be able to receive a, a substantial amount and that will tie them over for, for a significant amount of time. And that makes sense that the Oni is looking forward when will Purim come and he'll have an, an injection of cash. Okay, I see here on the chats. If I'm not mistaken, the Rebbe explains in the Sikh of Purim, the Inyan of Tzedakah on Purim is different. And the mitzvah is creating Simcha for those Aniyim. A later date has missed the Simcha. No, so uh, the, the, I understand perhaps your question. The answer is, the fact that he receives the money on, on Purim, whether he spends it on Purim or not, it doesn't matter. Tell someone he's won the pools. You'll see Simcha. Ah, he's not going to be able to, he won't be able to spend it all today. But the person receives, and now he's got, a, he had a pressure and a worry, and now he's got an amount of money. He says, this is a Simcha. That in itself is a Simcha. Um, someone's asking, can my money be used for Matonis Lev Yoinim? The answer basically no, because you can't use um, mice and money for something which you're behaved to. But once you've given your minimum matonis levyoin, you're given the first two prutas, all the rest you can use mice and money. So the minimum you should not be using mice and money, but anything beyond the minimum can, you can use mice and money for matonis levyoin. Let's move on. Um, right. So in passing, we had the discussion last week about Boyer and um, 
Oh, we were talking about this this um, French press coffee thing. And in passing, I mentioned about removing a tea bag. And a couple of our listeners from the recording were uh, a bit surprised what I'd said. So they asked me to revisit this. So I'm going to go here again. This is from Shabbos Kahalocha from um, uh, from Rav Forkash. And he writes the following. I, uh, taking out the tea bag from the water. The mere taking the bag out of the water itself is not boiling. And that I discussed last week, that taking a chunk of meat out of a cholent is not boiling because they are so distinct from one another. Whereas taking little bits of meat out of a goulash for yet later use, that would be a problem because they are there is a, a state of jumble, a conf confusion. So unjumbling a confused state, that's boiling. But when things are clearly distinct, that's not a problem of virus. So lifting the bag itself out of the water in itself is not a problem of virus. But there are those who raise the question that they say that you shouldn't do it directly. You can normally pull out the string in the weekday. You should do it with a spoon, not to take it out on its own. And he says the reason, because if you're going to lift the tea bag, and as you're lifting it, there's going to be drips of essence dripping out from the tea bag and they're going to drip back into the cup. So then it's as if you've strained these uh, drops of essence from the, the, the uh, tea leaves into, uh, and you know, use this kind of a strainer, which is the tea bag. Others are not worried about that either because you're not interested in those few drops. Your tea is strong enough. So those who say you, you can just remove, remove it normally, but um, others say you should lift it out with a spoon, which is a point which I mentioned last week. Um, but Beyond that, one doesn't need to be machmir. Um, someone's put on the chat, how much is the minimum in, in pounds? So um, what I mentioned last week, the minimum, is, well, now we've gone back to the shira pruta. I mentioned last week, the shira pruta is one and a half pence, uh, approximately. And therefore, um, with three pence in English penny money, you'd be yoyt um, one and a half pence to two, two anim, yeah, to, Right. Let's now um, go on to the uh, question, which again I received after the, um, the the agenda was sent out. So I received this question. Here is one of our shluchim, and he was busy a whole purim reading Megillah one after the other, and he made a late uh, Megillah reading. And uh, by then he had lost his voice. So he's, so he's in the middle of reading the Megillah and he just can't go further without a, a sip of water. So can he um, stop Megillah and make a brach and have a glass of water? And he's also worried, he was worried that he called me on Friday. Also, what about Shabbos in the middle of Kriya Satora? Could he have a sip of water in the middle of Kriya Satora? So really, he, Mama, she saved me from a, from a predicament because I had a problem in that it says, 30 days before Pesach, we have to start talking about Pesach. And I didn't have any, any questions about Pesach. All of this was going back about Purim and uh, Tanis Esther. I didn't have any questions connect, connected to Pesach. So they should be this, this this question connects with Pesach. Because we have in the Alter Rebbe's it says about B'dikas Chometz. And he's talking about making a bracha on B'dikas Chometz and Simitah Flamet Beis. And are you allowed to talk during B'dikas Chometz? So in Sif Zayin, you have the text on the, on the screen. That which we have a problem of Hefzik. If before you started the B'dikas Chometz, you made a bracha, then you start talking about unrelated matters. If you did speak, once you've started the Bedikah, you're in the process of Bedikah, you do not need to re repeat the Bracha. Because you're already in the process of the Mitzvah. So you've got a Mitzvah of Bedikah Shabbat, which takes half an hour, two hours, whatever it is, once you are, and he later on, he compares this to a person who makes a bracha, 
and he's sitting in the sukkah. And whilst he's sitting in the sukkah, he's doing a mitzvah every moment. He, he talks about last year's, uh, last year's snowy weather. Nothing to do with the sukkah. It doesn't matter. It, it, it doesn't, because he's in between the broche and like you make a broche, a very pure eights, and you eat an apple. Whilst you're in the middle of eating the apple, you can talk about other things. Between the broche and the first bite of the apple, that's where you have a problem of hefsu. So the same thing with the mitzvahs. Once you've made the broche on the Kriyasa Megillah, so then the fact that in the middle of the Megillah, you will stop to, 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 uh, for a sip of water and make a broche, so that's not a, uh, it's not a hefsu. It does not invalidate your broche. He did mention, because he was, his concern about having to drink during Kriyasa Torah, he would make Kiddush before, before um, Kriyasa Torah, after Shach, he would make Kiddush, and then he'd be having, wouldn't have a problem of uh, sipping, if necessary, during Kriya Satora. Uh, of course, uh, it would be advisable if you tell the people that he's done Kiddush not to uh, teach them a not good example of sipping stuff during uh, Kriya Satora before Kiddush. Um, right. Now, certainly it's not recommended to interrupt in the middle of Mikhail. What we're saying here, it's not a hef, so it doesn't invalidate, you don't have to do new brachas. Here we have in Shukhan Aruch, before I go back to the Shukhan Aruch in the top of the screen, the lower part, the Alter Rebbe, he refers to Tov Kav Tzadik Beis. That's in Hilchus Tekiyat Shreifer. That once you made a bracha and you started off the Tekiyas and in the middle of the Tekiyas between one, one Tekiyah and the other, you made it, you made a mafsik, you don't have to make the brachas again. But let's come back to Hilchus, that's Tov Kav Tzadik Beis and the top is from Tov Reish Tzadik Beis. <clears throat> so here the Mechaber says, Shkonoch says, Koro Seirugin. If you read the Megillah in with intervals, the Hainu Sheposak Bob, a show, you stopped in the middle or took a pause, Viaha Kachosa Le Mokoim Sheposak, and then you resume where you left off. I feel a show, Kadeligimer Sakula, even if the pause was so long that you could have finished the whole Megillah. Yotzi, you're still Yotze. And Shmai, he talks in Hichas Krishma about this kind of Hefsuk, but here he says, You are Yotze. Um, even if the pause was not just a silent pause, you also do a chatting, also it doesn't invalidate your reading of the Megillah. However, one should reprimand whoever talks in the middle of the Megillah, one should reprimand them because it's not the right thing, it's a distraction, etc. But, um, but Min Haddin, you are Yoitzer. So back to the question, if he, if he, holds, he can't continue, he should be able to um, stop and make a bracha. So last night, I do my rehearsals. In, in uh, We have Friday night, a mini shear after Mairib. And one of the uh, present, Tamir uh, Chachomim, raised the question. When you, we've gone through this not so long ago, I think, on water, one only makes a bracha on water if you are thirsty. But if, let's say, a person has to swallow a pill, and the uh, tablet, and they need to have some water. For that water, you don't make a bracha because you only make a bracha if it's if you're if you're thirsty. So he asked the question: If a person is not thirsty, it's just he's parched, and he's, he's, in other words, his, his throat is hurting him. Is that called drinking because you're thirsty? So um, I felt um, it was a double haposhet that it is. It's the same thing. So this morning I, I took out, this was last night, this morning I, take, I took out a sefer called Shari Habrocha, who taught, actually it says that this question has been raised, and I think the sefer Oz Nidbaru from Rabbi Yom Zilber raises this question, but the, it seems to remain that that is indeed the halacha, that if you are, the word is, if you're drinking water, let's say just because your doctor has told you you have to have so much fluid in your body every day, so you're drinking, you're not thirsty at all, but you have no benefit from it. But here, it's giving you relief. It's giving you um, your, your feeling is a strain in your throat. It's giving you a sense of relief. It's giving you a hanor. So that would be uh, justified to um, make a brocha. So I was pleased that I was able to uh, corroborate that. Right. Um, I see here that someone is writing. There's a couple of points here on the chat. And we'll finish off with this. Oh, some long chats here. I don't know whether we can manage everything. Seirugin is a style of writing where the psukim were not written in full, but only the first word and each letter on which... I, I, I don't think that's what he means over here. 
here means Seiruginen's in the reading, not in the style of writing. Um, right, so this is you asking about the broch which we just addressed. Finally, you have here regarding forwarding Matonus Levyonim to those um, that come to your Chabad house, or maybe the status of the gift aid um, be. Assuming that you can claim it down the line, is it designated for Aniyim, even though not Purim, by the time it comes, or can it be absorbed into the Chabad stock? Um, good point. And I believe that the, the, the government um, refund, or whatever you want to call it, um, is, is, not, is not part of the Matonas Levyonim. They've given you, a, a, let's say, 20 pounds, and that 20 pounds of Matonas Levyonim, the, uh, the extra money which you get, get from, from the government, um, really, uh, they, they, they could even ask for it back, but they've given it to you. I'm not talking about Minhalocha, but um, I think that belongs to the Chabad house. Um, right, okay. Um, we'll stop with this and wish you all a good tavoch and uh, mar bim besimcha. And um, as I said, and then for the next week, I'll see. Perhaps we'll do this year a little bit later, perhaps quarter to nine, if we I feel that like eight thirty is a bit too tight. And uh, but after that, we'll still have to decide um, which way, whether we go to Sunday evening or uh, Thursday evening. But uh, thank you all for joining us and look forward to meeting you in good health, Carl Tuff.